Let's go, folks. Time for the Gibby Show. Hey, doing baseball fans, and welcome to another edition of the Gibby Show presented by Miller Lite, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the Gibby Show. I'm John Arezzi, and joining me, the two-time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, former member of the 1986 world champion New York Mets, the number one best-selling author, and the voice of the audio version of Gibby, <laughs> Tales of a Baseball Life, which releases this week on all the audiobook platforms. Uh, he's heading up to Toronto this week to participate in the ceremony, inducting Jose Batista to the Blue Jays' level of excellence on Saturday. He's the man that always tells it like it is. Direct from San Antonio, Texas, the baseball life for himself, John Gibbons. Gibby, how you doing today? Johnny, I'm doing good as always, brother. Appreciate the introduction. Got a great show today. We got some of the big top one. dogs in the game. So we're we, looking forward to this one. Yeah, we got a big one. So we're, you know, we have a lot to go over today. We got a big promotion that we're going to talk about with Miller Lite doing something special with their fans. We got a couple of great guests uh, and gabbing with Gibby. Jose Batista is going to join us today. And uh, we're going to also bring on a premier baseball analyst who's uh Coming back on the show, uh, Ken Rosenthal. It's going to be a great conversation about the trade deadline, the state of the Jays. So why don't we get right into the leadoff, John. Uh, The Jays off a great weekend sweep of the division rivals, the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park, sparked by the debut of a rookie who just exploded onto the scene, uh, second baseman uh, Davis Schneider. Uh, they're already calling him Bay, but uh, John, after losing three or four against the AL East leading Baltimore Orioles, the Jays went to Boston licking their wounds, but turned it all around against the Sox. They won 7-3 Friday, 5-4 Saturday in the blowout, 13-1 on Sunday. So uh, before we get to Schneider, uh, did being dominated by the O's last week spark this team to getting it turned around against Boston? It looked like they came out with a purpose. They came out a little angry Friday, and they and they did their business and did it well over the weekend. Johnny, I, I don't know if that plays in baseball. You know, you get angry because you know, then because then you say, "Well, you should have got angry," you know, three months ago. You know, because it, it's not it's it's an emotional game, but it's not the roller or the uh, very aggressive type thing that you get in other sports, right? I think what happened is at first they were due to beat Boston, right? You know, they. They, they were 0-7 going in. And, you know, Paxton, who, who pitched the open night for Boston, has been very tough on the Blue Jays. He no-hit us back when I was there, and he was tough earlier in the year against them. thought they had a great game plan. They came out of the chute swinging, right, and then mm-hmm. uh, ambushing him. You know, he, Merrifield, first first pitch of the game, and, and then uh, Guerrero before you know it. And I, and I think they put them in the hole. And then, you got you to remember, Toronto's got such good pitching, top to bottom, you know, the, the rotation. You know, it's, it's really come together. Manoa looked like the old Manoa. And then they, their bullpen is as good as anybody, and they shored it up, you know, with guys uh, Hicks and Cabrera have been very good. They got from St. Louis. So they're just a good team. They're, they're not – they're sitting in a great spot right now as it is, and they can make a run, you know. But the, that young kid, Schneider, he may be the spark plug they need. Yeah, let's talk about him. I mean, he was not uh, really on anybody's radar if you take a look at it. I mean, they, they bring him up. Uh, he was called up from Buffalo. He had nine hits in his first three games, including a home run over the Green Monster in his first major league at bat. Very impressive to start. Two hits in the debut, three hits in the second game, four hits on Sunday, including another home run that went not only over the Monster but out of the ballpark, uh, four RBIs in Sunday's game. So his first three games, 692 average, 1.15 OPS, Tied a major league record with nine hits in his first three games. And that match, John, you may be familiar with this guy, Coker Triplett. Have you heard of Coker Triplett, who did it for the Chicago Cubs in 1938? And uh, Schneider now. Hey, hey, Kenny Rosenthal. Kenny will know who that was. Yeah, I'll definitely bring it up. Coker Triplett. Hey, Hey, Schneider got more hits in three days than I got my whole career, for crying out loud. I didn't know the game was that easy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, and he did he did it at one of the cathedrals of baseball, Fenway Park, and you know what? Uh, I've heard. I don't know much about the kid, but I, you know, I've, I've followed a little bit since he got up there, and it's a great story. He was thinking about quitting a couple years ago, and 
you know, he's having a big year in Buffalo. Maybe that's the reason they didn't go out and get a bat. Who knows that, the, you know, everybody was kind of saying, well, they need to get a, an additional bat, but maybe, maybe uh, this, this is the secret weapon they, they had in reserve. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, he was a 28th round draft pick uh, for the Jays in 2017, 849th pick overall. They don't even have that anymore. Uh, and, and in Buffalo, he had 21 home runs. He had a 969 OPS. Uh, but, John, as a manager, you got to, and how do you find a way, or do you have to find a way to keep this guy in the lineup every day right now? Oh yeah, man. What do you, unless you want to get fired or something, you know. <laughs> they, 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 they call me dumb. I'm dumb, but not stupid now. Um, heck, they, but this is. I mean, this is typical. This is analytics baseball. And he's hitting third. He's been in the big leagues two games. Next thing you know, he's hitting third, man. You gotta love it, you know. And he responded. You know what? I. Th- you know what? You got. You got to keep playing. You got to ride it out. He's not going to get nine hits every every three games anyway. Yeah. But you know, this could be the guy that you know just kind of lightens thing up around there. I want to get uh, Kenny Rosenthal's opinion. Let's get Kenny in here, man, his yeah. expertise. He's right here in the weight room. Let's bring him on. Now joining us, uh, of course, to discuss everything that we're talking about. The trade deadline is the senior baseball writer for The Athletic and uh, regular contributor to Fox Sports MLB telecast. Ken Rosenthal, welcome back to The Gibby Show. Thanks, John. And first of all, I must tell Gibby, he was teammates with Coker Triplett back in 1939 or whatever that was. <laughs> you need to fess up to that right now. Hey, man, dude, you, hey, your knowledge is limitless. There's nobody no, better no, in the not, business with this kind of, this actually, kind of stuff. So, it, John, if it was limitless, I would have heard of David Schneider long before he got here, and I really didn't know much about him at all. And as you guys are saying – it's a great story. I don't know if he can be the kind of guy that turns the season around. He is what he is, right? 28th round draft pick. But he had a monster numbers at AAA this year. So the lift that they needed is something he's providing, especially with Bo out. And it'll be interesting to see. I mean, he's not going to do this all year. But if he can at least be a consistent, solid contributor, maybe the guy that they thought they wanted to get in the, at the trade deadline, the right-handed bat. And maybe he's that guy. Oh, yeah. Hey, Atkins, Ross will be a hero, man. If this kid turns out to – oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you got, Jay? Yeah, let's uh, – yeah, uh, before we get into everything that happened at the trade deadline, obviously, uh, let's touch upon the Braves. Uh, and We talked about the great debut by Schneider. Uh, but, guys, to both of you, the Jays lost three or four to Baltimore, and then they go to Fenway, and their bats finally come alive. Springer comes back strong. Varsho does well. The rookie sensation does what he does. The pitching is good. Uh, how does this happen? Which Blue Jays team is this? Is this the team that almost got s- swept by the O's or the team that dominated the Red Sox? Who are they? It's, it's funny. At the All-Star break, at the game, actually, I asked Whit Merrifield a similar type of question. I said, hey, man, when are you guys going to take off? You guys are really good, but you haven't really played that way yet. And his response to me was, and I don't remember how many games over they were at the time, but he was saying something along the lines of, we're seven or eight over, whatever the number was. And we're okay. We're fine. Now, the Orioles are really good. And Right now, they're hot. They're playing really well. I don't know if they can sustain it with their pitching, their starting pitching being the way it is, even with the addition of Flaherty. And when you ask which is the real Jays team, John, I think you would agree with this, Gibby. It's always something in between, right? Not as good as you look when you're going good. You're not as bad as you look when you're going badly. And I, I would think that's something closer to the truth. But they have room to grow because Guerrero has not had a monster year and Kirk just been okay and they can be better. And I'm interested to see if they are better because you guys are right. Their pitching is probably the best in the division right now, even ahead of Tampa Bay, which has had some injury problems. Yeah. You know what, Kenny, when they, before the season started, everybody's kind of, a lot of, well, a lot of people, crowned them the champs, right? Or they said they have a legitimate shot. No doubt. That's fair, right? But, you know, they didn't like – it wasn't like they had re- brought in certain guys over the offseason that guaranteed that, right? I mean, it was like they were still a good team, but there's not necessarily a whole lot different than last year, let's say, right? And, and uh, 
And then when Tampa got off to that incredible start, it kind of it, it pushed everybody back. And so there's a lot of Nate, well, they're not playing as good as they can. But they're but they're sitting pretty right now. You know, and there's that you know, that wild card starting to, you know, the, the teams chasing them are kind of dropping off a little bit and they're a game behind Houston. And, you know, they get still some interleague games or some uh, division games coming up. So it's it's like you sometimes what do you want, man? You know, I mean, they got a good team. We're going to, we're going to a playoffs right here. Uh, Tampa gets off to an incredible start, right? But where are they now? You know, injuries got them. It was like the Yankees last year, historic start. They killed their bullpen, right? Everybody was dropped like flies. And they came back to the pack and they still got in. So you never know. You, the beauty of the wild card, you don't have to win the division. Right. And if you get hot, hot at the right time, all you got to do is get in, right? That's, you know, the, the I Braves were an example it, of that it, a couple of years ago. It just seems to me, Gibby, that they have such talent, extreme talent, really. And they haven't played quite to that level yet. They've shown flashes, but they haven't played quite that well. So maybe when Bo comes back, they'll be able to kind of take it up to another gear. And even if they don't, even if they play this way the rest of the year, they're probably fine, right? They go into the playoffs and who knows? They may be very well one of the better teams in the playoffs because the pitching is really good. And Manoa coming back now and being Manoa, that's going to help them big time. So I don't rule them out as a World Series team. But at the same yeah. time, they've left their fans this season. And maybe the expectations were too high. And maybe it's a little unfair. But they've left their fans wanting more. And that's kind of where they've been. But we'll see. A long way to go. Well, hey, how would you like to be the uh, Seattle Mariners fans? Or, or you know, or, well, or yeah. the, the Red Sox, the New York Yankees. Come, come on. You know, they're, they're – um, you know, they, they're gonna they're gonna be fine. I, I predicted they get into the World Series at the beginning of the year too. So you know, mm-hmm. I don't know that you did that, but that wouldn't surprise me at all. In in the they're, they're still one of the best teams in baseball, hands down, no doubt. Yeah, to, to follow up on that a little bit. I mean, as we head into the stretch, and uh, Jays are in it right now. Uh, it looks like the Yankees in Boston are kind of faltering a little bit. Uh, uh, do you think that the Mariners are going to be the biggest challenge for the uh, for the Jays to get into that? Uh, wild card spot and that rivalry is starting to heat up a little bit and then of course you got Houston which is basically tied uh, with the Blue Jays half a game difference uh, so uh, uh, Ken what do you think I mean what's the uh, you know what's your projection of uh, who's going to be there at the end in this tight race the Mariners have played well of late and it's surprising because they traded their closer Paul Seawall this is kind of a yeah. tradition with the Mariners they trade their closer in the middle of the season they think that's kind of the right thing to do they did it for their own reasons. They thought short-term and long-term it would boost their offense because of the players they got back, an outfielder from the Diamondbacks, another infielder. Okay. But that's another team that after last year, when they finally made the playoffs for the first time since 2001, has largely been a disappointment. And they haven't played as well as the Jays. Let's not even confuse the two. No, no doubt. But at the same time, they're an interesting club because they have pitching as well. And... Their young starting pitching is really the envy of the game. I just don't see them offensively being anywhere near as capable as the Jays. So if I had to guess right now, my three wildcard teams are Houston, the Jays, and the AL East team that does not win the division, whether it's the Orioles or Tampa Bay. Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. Hey, hey, Texas now, they lost Young down at third baseman. He did. With a broken thumb. You know what? That's it. And There's maybe no Houston, no, that's a big right. And Houston with Verlander, and now with Alvarez and Altuve back, and possibly Brantley coming back. Maybe they are capable of catching Texas. We know Houston; they know how to win games at this time of year. At the same time, Texas has played really well. And yes, Young is out, but they'll plug in Ezekiel Duran or Josh Smith Jr. They have players and. Right. Yeah, they added at the deadline Scherzer and Montgomery and before that Chapman. So they're still quite formidable. And losing Young's a big blow, all-star third baseman. But at the same time, I don't expect them to slow down. They've played for stretches without Seager this year and been quite good. Yeah, no no doubt. Hey, Kenny, you know, if, 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 this is the way I view it. It's all about getting hot, right, at the right time yep. and who's yep. playing. I mean, look, look, look at – if you look at the – the league right now. Look at look at the Cincinnati Reds. You know they were just kind of sputtering along at the beginning of the season. They caught fire. They brought up a couple of players, and then they were they, as hot as can be. Right? They took over first place. 
now they've lost like six in a row and they, you know, they're still, they're still right there, but that's just kind of the way it works. You know, the, the Pittsburgh Pirates at the beginning of the year were 20 games over or something now, like they're 10 below. It's like, you know, it's, it's, everybody does find their level, you know, uh, the, the Diamondbacks, they were on top of the world, right? Now they've lost like six in a row or something. So it's going to go down to the wire and it's who gets hot. You know, there's going to be some disappointed fan bases because somebody's going to get knocked out at the end there. But then they, then they, they, they ride it on in, you know, but uh, it's like, even like the Anaheim Angels, you know, they came, they go sweep Detroit. Yeah. You got to keep in mind it is Detroit. And then they go to, then they get, they, of course you got Blue Jays and they go to Atlanta and they go home and Seattle sweeps them. That's just kind of the way the game is. You know, it gives you a lot, a lot of hope and a lot of false reality sometimes. You know? Well, the deadline, though, can change things, too. And Cincinnati was one of the teams, and Arizona was, too, that didn't land a starting pitcher. Now, Cincinnati needed, in my opinion, a starting pitcher badly. They've got young kids. They've got Green and Lodolo coming back, they hope, healthy and fine. But we're seeing it now. They're running out of pitching. And the Diamondbacks are running out young kids behind Gallon and Kelly. The problem was at the deadline that there weren't enough sellers and there weren't enough pitchers available to satisfy every team that needed a starting pitcher. So you saw teams get shut out. The Red Sox shut out. The Reds shut out. The Diamondbacks the same. The Dodgers did not get the second starter that they wanted after Lance Lynn. And the Braves were looking for a starter too, but really couldn't find that depth piece that they were looking for. So it's interesting to see how some of this is already playing out really quickly in the Reds' case. They're just really struggling to hold down opponents. And I don't see it getting better, even with Green and Lodola coming back. Those guys are fairly young, too. And it's going to be a tough road for them going forward, especially now that the Cubs are so hot and the Brewers. I liked what they did at the deadline with Carlos Santana, Marcana, Andrew Chafin. It was a pretty good, impressive move there. Yeah, you know some of these some of these young teams that are on the upswing. You know, Baltimore went out and made a move for a pitcher. They had to have a pitcher. Yep. You tip your hat to them. But a lot of them, you know, they got these young, good young players. They want to hold on to them forever. You know, you don't want to start parting ways too, unless you're. Well, and this is a big you know? thing, Gibby. You know this too, and I think you'll agree with this. You don't get to choose when your competitive window opens. Right. Sometimes it's you're ahead of schedule. Reds are ahead of schedule. Orioles are ahead of schedule. Sorry, you can't just say. Um, next year. No, you got to go. Now, again, in defense of the Reds, it was a difficult market to get starting pitching. And I don't know that Jack Flaherty makes the difference for them that he will for Baltimore. Maybe not. But at the same time, that was one of the things I kept writing before the deadline with regard to the Orioles. This team is loaded with prospects, as are the Reds, by the way. Hey, man, you got to go. You can't just wait for next year. You can't just hope. Things change. You never know who get injured. It might not be the same with regard to where you are in the standings. So I do applaud the Orioles. I think they could have gone even further, maybe gotten another reliever. But that's where we are with the deadline, or where we were with the deadline this year. And some teams reacted, and others not as well. Yeah. And you know what? There's no guarantee. Those all those prospects, they 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 don't that's all make exactly it. right. You know, there's very few can't miss guys out there, you know, and majority of them won't make it if we, if, if we want to look at statistics, you know, that's just the way it is. So, yeah, but it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be a good final couple months. You're, and listen, we're going to be tuning in to you left and right, man. And there's nobody does it better. And we appreciate that, you know, and uh, appreciate you coming on here. Johnny, you got anything before we, we'd let Kenny go? Yeah, I do have one thing. As you know, I'm, uh, you know, Mets fan. And, uh, you know, obviously oh, what wow. happened at the trade deadline. Ken, on a serious note, it's it's really something that I don't ever recall as uh, somebody who has watched Major League Baseball and been attending since 1966. I have never seen a team decimated like this one and buying their farm system back. Have you ever seen it's never anything happened, like John. this? It's not, never not happened. like this. No, and we've never seen an owner like Steve Cohen. No. And as a baseball writer, it's actually difficult kind of to follow him because he does things so differently than every other owner ever has done. Ever. So we have to kind of recalibrate what the expectations of him should be and what he might do. This kind of thing that he did, basically buying prospects along with trading Scherzer and Verlander to ease that possibility that's different it's 
actually kind of revolutionary within the sport. I don't know that any other owner would do it to the extent that he did it. No other owner has the money he has. So again, it's a simple matter of evaluating him differently or really expecting him to do things differently than other owners because this is uncharted territory for the sport. For him, it makes perfect sense. He's got the money, man. He wants to retool, and he saw a losing proposition with this team. He said, "The heck with it. Let's get out. Let's get some young kids and keep building." I get it, and I kind of like it. But at the same time, you're punting 2024 in the New York yeah. market, yeah. despite what they say. And as John was just saying, prospects. Who knows? These kids. They're not all going to pan out. They're not all going to be stars. Everyone knows that. Right. Anything could happen. And then you uh, you get a, a kid that no one really has heard about, like a David Schneider. He comes in and he's like, it, anything could happen. It's a roll of the dice. Exactly and, right. Uh, you never great. know. That's you the beauty know. of it. That's why we're all, we all love the game. That's, that's why exactly that's right. That's our profession, right? That's, that's right. Exactly, exactly right. That is what we love about it. Yeah. So, all right. Well, listen, Kenny, it's always a pleasure, pal. You know what? All Nobody right, thanks, does it guys. better. Keep up, keep up the good work. I cannot believe you didn't wear your bow tie on the show right here. This is a little better show than your. Well, than you, us I cannot believe you're being this kind on our sh- on your show when <laughs> off the air. Of course, it's a different kind of conversation. But thanks for all the kind words. Uh, you know I mean it. All right, see you, Kenny. <laughs> see you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, John. Great lead off, Ken. What an expert! I always love hearing his analysis on baseball. Always. Yeah, you know what, Johnny? He, he's one of the best. He's a great dude, very knowledgeable and all that. But that's kind of the beauty of our sport, right? You could take anybody, you know, any fan out there. That's what drives the interest. And we're all, we can all be experts. We all can think we're experts, right? And, uh, you know, this, we can second guess the hell out of everything they do, you know. And, and, and uh, that's what drives baseball, you know. Everybody thinks they can manage. Everybody wants to be the manager. Uh, that's, I love it. Yeah. Hey, you are listening to The Gibby Show presented by our friends at Miller Lite. And, John, I mean, Miller Lite is coming up with a fabulous promotion for everybody up in Toronto. I don't know if you heard about this one or not, but, uh, you know, Toronto baseball fans have been eating a record-setting amount of hot dogs uh, at games this season with a jaw-dropping 75,000 hot dogs consumed in a single game, and a remarkable 350,000 hot dogs devoured in just half a season. So our friends at Miller Lite, to celebrate those hot dogs, and as the official beer of Major League Baseball, Miller Lite is committed to satisfying Toronto's taste buds outside the confines of the stadium. So that's why the brand is introducing Miller Lite Beer Dogs, a one of a kind, <laughs> one of a kind food Love truck uh, popping up. It's going to be there just in time for when you get into town, August twelfth, uh, right in time for the ceremony uh, for the beloved Bat Flip King, and we all know who they're talking about there. Uh, stocked with complimentary footlong hot dogs and the perfect teammate, ice cold Miller Light. This can't-miss summer experience will allow the Toronto baseball fans to share a bite and raise a bat-shaped glass with a front-row seat of a jumbotron that'll stream the big pregame ceremony this weekend. So if you're craving a visit, check out Toronto's Rendezvous, August the 12th, that's a Saturday, 1 to 4 p.m., uh, stay around for all the details at Miller Lite CA, and you'll get all the info you need. But free hot dogs and beer, John. Can't beat that. Hey, hey, baseball hot dogs. What was it? It was a car company. And, uh, yeah. Baseball Miller Lite. hot dogs, apple pie, and Miller Chevrolet. Lite. And Miller Lite, Miller, exactly. Miller, Miller, Taking them yeah. out and putting Miller Lite right in there for sure. 75,000 dogs, man. Oh, that is, dogs. That, hey, listen, that, that, is, that is baseball, baseball right there. That is baseball. Exactly right, Gibby. I do want and to talk- wash it down with a Miller Lite. Yes, absolutely. That's the only way you go with that. Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite. Great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. I do want to talk to you about this weekend. Obviously, it's a huge weekend for Jose Batista. 
the level of excellence is just an incredible honor and not very many guys been put into it. But for you, it's significant in a lot of ways too, because this will be the first time that you actually return to the Rogers Center and get on the field since uh, you left the organization. So do you got butterflies at all about this weekend? Well, I, I, I think I'm, I could be more excited, you know, uh, number one, uh, you know, when, when you get a chance, it's, it's, a, it's quite an honor and it's a privilege to get the chance to manage in the big leagues. Right. And then when you have star players that, that, uh, makes it that, makes it that much more, uh, enjoyable. Right. And then when you get, one of them gets put into one of the hall of fame type things, it's like, you know, that, that, that's, that's icing on the cake. And uh, to get a chance to go up there and watch watch Jose, you know, get put in is um, it's, it's pretty special. Something I'll always remember because you know, hey, I, I don't I don't last as long managing in Toronto without Jose Batista on the field. You know, and, and uh, he's uh, he, he's beloved up there. And you know, but I got a big week. I'm going to Vancouver today, Monday afternoon, for to see the 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 Canadians, the Blue Jays A ball team. Wow, and then coming back, and then heading up to Toronto. So this is a I'm that Great White North man. I'm a, I'm 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 be cruising that Great White North. Can't wait because you know it's it's a it's a special place to me. Yeah, it's going to be a very special week for you, and uh, just have a wonderful time and and just soak it all in. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Uh, so we're happy to let everybody know you'll be back at the Rogers Center for this big celebration this weekend. It's very very cool. Well, John. Uh, now it's time for Gabbing with Gibby with our special guest, and that's brought to you by our friends over at Tim Hortons. And I got to let you know, uh, and I got to ask you a question. Do you want to know the best way to have breakfast at Tim's? I'm sure you want to know that. Of course that. I want to know. Of course. Well, <laughs> yeah. gather, gather the crew to try the new Smoky Honey Bacon Breakfast Sandwiches with Smoky. a sweet and yeah, what a sweet and savory glaze made from 100% Canadian honey, new double smoked bacon, and a freshly cracked Canadian egg. They're a perfect way to start the day. Try one at participating Tim Hortons restaurants in Canada for a limited time. And John, make sure that you go into Tim's while you're up there and enjoy one of those for me, please. Oh yeah, I'll have a, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have one for you, big man. Uh, you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll plan on stopping there when I get out to Vancouver, the Cove, and then uh, when I'll be back in Toronto, because the, the area I'm staying is it's. I know there's a few of them sitting right around there. It'd be like like uh, going back in time, man. Now, of course, it's time for gabbing with Gibby. Today on Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons, we bring back to the show one of the true legends of the Toronto Blue Jays. And this weekend, he will be the 11th member of the Level of Excellence and only the first induction since 2018, joining a very exclusive club. It is indeed our pleasure to welcome Jose Batista to Gabbing with Gibby. Jose, welcome back and congratulations. Thank you very much. As usual, thanks for having me. You guys are doing some great stuff, so I'd love to be a part of it. Hey, Jose, little did I realize a few years ago that I, I would be doing this kind of crap, you know? <laughs> but, but, but the, hey, the only reason I get to do this is because, you know what, I, I got to manage you, right? What you, what you did on the field kept me around the game a little bit longer, and you know what, allows me to do this kind of thing. So it's, it's fun. I'm not, I'm not a natural uh, – interview or whatever you want to say, but we're, we're going to have a little fun here. But listen, incredible, incredible award, right? Well-deserved and Blue Jays history. There's not many guys up there and, and they have a storied history. And, and uh, that's got to, that's got to make you feel pretty good. Doesn't it? it uh, it's a, it's a sel very select group. That's right. No doubt. The no doubt is a great feeling. You feel honored, you feel happy. And it's great to, to have guys like me come back and be a part of the organization and have kind of like our little space there forever. So uh, I, I'm definitely excited about it and I couldn't be more humbled uh, and proud to, to be a part of the level of excellence moving forward. Hey, you know, it, yeah, the incredible career, but I don't think everybody realizes it, it wasn't easy for you at the beginning, right? I, nobody gave, nobody wanted to seem to want to give you an opportunity. You know, you bounced around with, I think it was five different major league clubs early on, right? There was a, I read somewhere you set a record, like 
one season you were on five different major league rosters. It's the first time that had ever happened. Yeah, my rookie year, because I got rule five. That's the other thing. I got rule five from, from high A ball uh, out of the Pirates to the Orioles. So every team okay. that kept trying to trade for me had to keep me in the big leagues, and that's why I was with so many teams uh on that particular year so my development early on was a little delayed right because when you're rule five if you're not playing every day up in the big list you're sitting in the bench and that's what happened i only got 80 at bat i maybe started 10 or 15 games so then i had to go back after 2004 to the minors and get more development done down in double a AA and triple a and then back in 06 i was kind of back and i never looked back but still yeah everybody's path is different to your point of how hard it was at the beginning. You have to come up here and make your mark. Yes, I, I went to junior college. I didn't go to a big D1 school. I wasn't a first rounder. I was 20th rounder. Typically, when when you come from that type of round pick and signing uh, background, you do have to make it happen. And and it usually takes a little longer. Uh, and it kind of did for me, but my path was a little deviated because of the whole Rule 5 thing. Uh, and eventually it worked out, you know, uh, but... Definitely my first four or five years in the big leagues were a grind. And that made me appreciate the success when I got it even more. Yeah, that's, I think, and that's that had to be a motivator for you too, wasn't it? For sure. But that's the only thing I knew. Every time, you know, I, I was trying to sign out of the Dominican as a non drafted free agent, which is a normal path that most, got, most guys take. I was rejected there or offered too little. So I was like, screw it. I'll keep going. Went to Juco, grind it there. Uh, ended up getting drafted. But then in the minors, I wasn't like a top, top prospect. I was like top 10, but I wasn't top two, to top three. So I grind it there. And then in the big leagues, I'm like backing up, utility guy, grind it there, you know? That's all I knew. So to me, that was the normal. So um, maybe some people that were in bigger roles, like, you know, the, the high school superstar that was the starter and was a quarterback at the same time, got drafted in the first round and got a big bonus. Maybe that guy, if he has to grind a little bit because they never experienced it, it's a different uh, story. But for me, that's all I knew. So I just grinded my way through until finally cracked it open uh, with the Blue Jays. And now we know who's going on that wall. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's right. A, that's, all right. So t- t- 2008, they trade for you. Right? You, co- you. You come to the Blue Jays where, where it all comes together for you. But even then, you, you bounced around a little bit. They, you, you were – a part-time player, weren't you? And played some third base and play then you weren't a full-time outfielder until a few years Ten. after that, right? Ten. Right. But you know, that was more team construction and where the organization was uh at that moment, right? They had a bunch of big stars. They had Scott Rowland, BJ Ryan, Vernon Wells, Alex Rios, Lyle Overbay. They had big names, right? So they, there wasn't an opening for me to just plug in. Uh, but I think the thought coming in. And you would have to ask Anthopoulos and, and J.P. Ricciardi a little bit more. It's like, oh, this guy can play a little bit. He has some pop. That plays in the American League, especially in the East. And we can plug him in when guys need days off. And he can play outfield. He can play infield. So uh, it's a good backstop to have when guys are hurting with the turf and all that. So, But eventually that changed uh, in 09. Uh, there was a change of strategy. Uh, and, you know, you saw it soon after that Anthopoulos got the job over J.P., so those changes started happening in 09 when some guys started getting traded and that created holes, which is what brought my opportunity along. Hey, let me tell you something. You said all them, all them big name guys in 2008, all the big name guys got me fired in the end of June of 2008, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and talk about hey. crossing paths. I came in on the deadline in 08. So I came in when Cito came back at the same time. It's, it wasn't because of Cito. I'm sure they asked him at that point, but, uh, JP brought me in right when, you know, after the deadline. And that's, I guess, when you, you switch with Cito. Right. Yeah. And let me, I, that's, that's where I'm going next. Cito, Cito's had a tremendous effect on hitters and the guys that have come through the Blue Jays, right? Did he have a big impact? You know, I know, I know Murph, you, you knew Murph, Murph helped you out a little bit too, right? But the, both those guys instrumental, did they change? Is that where you got your leg kick? Is that kind of where you made some adjustments is with those guys? They were both instrumental. For them, it was more about being ready on time, not the leg kick. The leg kick, I kind of developed naturally. It's just what, okay. you know, implementing a way to get ready on time earlier kind of uh, express itself with a leg kick for me. And for guys, it's different. But I used to have a small leg kick and then a toe tap. So I was tinkering with stuff in the past. When I was little, I did have a leg kick, but uh, throughout my 
you know, even in college, I had to like it. But in the minors is where they were like, you know, you got to get rid of it because it did, it did bring some inconsistency. But li little did I know, or I found out later, it was because I didn't get consistently ready throughout the pitcher's delivery. Oh, so I was super late. You know, I used to like get my hands going as the pitcher was releasing the ball. And what Cito and Murph preach is get your hands ready as the pitcher takes the ball out of the glove. And that gives you a whole nother like second to just watch the ball, right? Uh, it doesn't look or seem like a lot, but in in uh, baseball terms, when it comes to a pitch being delivered and you swinging, that's ages. So uh, for me, the, the leg kick happened after, but it was tough. It was tough getting changing my rhythm because being ready so early for me it felt out of sync. It felt like I was already ready to pull the trigger and the ball wasn't even out of the pitcher's hand. Uh. So, but uh, I stuck through it, worked on it at BP in the cage and in the games while I wasn't playing much. Uh, my stats and my production was still kind of iffy. Then I went to winter ball and continued to work on it. And then just in September of 09 and throughout that winter ball season and spring training, it just felt like I was a different person. It was like somebody finally unlocked my swing and I was able to get consistent with it. And then you took off. Then, hey, then you look at that picture sitting behind you there. How many home runs was that? 54? That's right. 54. 2010, yeah. baby. 2010. <laughs> It, 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 and I know you think about it. I'm, I'm, when I think 54 home runs for crying out loud, that's, I mean, that's. Uh, it's like, I don't even believe I did it sometimes, you know, it's uh, if it, that season felt magical and it felt like everybody was throwing, throwing me fastballs in. And I've watched a couple of clips, even on YouTube where they have the homers one after the other. And every pitch was inside, inside, inside. Cause that's how usually teams were attacking me in the past. Because I was so late, they would just bang me in and I would just not be able to get the head out. So, But it took him a while to realize that I had made that adjustment and I was starting to hit the inside pitch better. So later on in 2011 and, and so on, you know, I wasn't getting pitched inside anymore. Even throughout the rest of my career, when I retired, nobody used to throw me inside consistently anymore. No, they didn't throw you inside. They threw behind <laughs> you for crying out loud. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you what, when I, when I look back, I it, it amazes me because you know I've been I was in the game forty something years right as a, as a player and a coach and so I, I've seen a lot of seen a lot of great players I've seen this, the pitching and all that I have never seen anybody you know you you were a spark plug teams guys there's a lot of guys on certain teams didn't like you you were an emotional player but you burned them so many times you know a lot of a lot of them would try they would try to disrupt you I'd see, we'd see guys throw behind you and you turn around and you take them deep I have never seen that man it's like because usually I mean human nature. Somebody, somebody throws one at your head or your back. I mean, it, it makes you, it puts you on your heels a little bit. But I tell you what, time after time, I mean, I'd be sitting in the dugout and I said, somebody throw one behind you. And I'd say, the bench coach, I said, listen, that, that's the worst thing that dude can do. Man. That's not <laughs> cool. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and I can't explain it either. The only thing I can think of is when somebody does that, it just made me want to beat him even more. So for some reason, I just, I tried to do less and just really focus on on having a good at bat. And typically I had good success. So um, but it does, I do know what you're talking about. And and it it's something that sticks out in my head too. Like every time somebody would try to hit me, I would I would do something good. Oh, I know, but I'm telling you, that that I, I, that is some kind of rare, man. You know what? But you got guts, you know what? And you know what? You hey, you back you back things up. That's that's you know, that's that's what superstars do, right? Introducing the new Smoky Honey Bacon Breakfast Sandwiches at Tim's. With a sweet and savory glaze made with 100% Canadian honey, new double smoked bacon, and a freshly cracked Canadian egg. Try a twist on your breakfast faves with our new Smoky Honey Bacon Breakfast Sandwiches at Tim's. All right, so you hit 54 home runs, right? The team still is kind of sputtering along, right? They, they, you know, it's it can't be a one-man show. And so fast forward a little bit to when, when I, I get there in – you know, then they, a couple a couple additions. You know, your your old college teammate Russell Martin. Russ, I don't know people. People, I think a lot of people know Russell was your college teammate, but not everybody. That's hey, that's pretty damn. I mean, that's two superstar players. That's pretty damn good. You know, come from that small school. Yeah, and Coach Johnson's going to be there, so you'll get to meet him. And he's had, I want to say, over twenty major leaguers at this point. The the problem is a lot of people 
when it's not good marketing material, you're right. When a guy gets called up and he went to LSU, everybody's like, oh, this guy, first round pick from LSU or vendor, but nobody says Chipola College from Florida, right? But the team has another player that came from uh, mm -hmm. Chipola as well right now, Bowden Francis, and nobody knows about it. Nobody talks about it, but Adam Duvall went there. Myself, Adam Lowen back in the day with Baltimore. Oh. Um, you know, Tyler Flowers went there. You know, there's a big list. Those are the names that are kind of fresh in my head. But um, a left-handed starter for um, for the Nationals. Uh, he's struggling now, but he's he's had some great years. Um, there's there's a lot of players that Coach Johnson has coached to the big leagues, and I'm I'm glad and happy to see that he's going to be there with you, and you guys will get to meet each other. Damn, that's yeah, that's that's a pretty good list, man. That's a pretty good baseball school. So, that's right. All right, so let's let's fast forward. It's been twenty something years in a Blue Jay playoff drought, right? In two thousand and fifteen, a couple big acquisitions at the trade deadline, and, and team just got caught fire, right? And we go we go on, we get we get into the playoffs. All right, we go down. Everybody knows the story. I'm a hundred times right. We go. We get down. O two. You guys didn't panic. You never panicked, right? We tie it up down in Texas. We go back to the game. One of the it's one of the most going to be most remembered games in in baseball history, right? Okay, and and this this isn't where you made your name, but this is when you kind of solidified who you were. The bat, the the big home run. We're down that seventh inning. You know what? Give us a quick synopsis on that again, brother. I know you've said it a hundred times. No, I know, but it, it's, it's still, it's still exci exciting to talk about, right? So, like you said, we were down 0-2 at home. We lost the first two games at home. Went down to Texas and beat them, you know, without home field advantage uh, twice. So, we tied it. And if it was a five-game series, come back home to Toronto. And that game was crazy to to begin with, with, you know, obviously good pitching, good defense, no run scored till later. But then Russell threw the ball back. It hit – um it hit the bat, and there was somebody at third. They ended up scoring. Um, so we felt like, you know, that was kind of a weird way for them, for us to lose the lead, per se. And then uh, in that seventh inning, just stuff started going our way, you know, with the three errors from their infielders on on some bunts and a routine ground ball, setting up the stage for them playing the infield in uh, with no outs, which was weird. I think it was no outs or one out, and then – Donaldson gets jammed and hits a little blooper. That would have been probably an easy pop-up to second base. Uh, and then that set up the stage for, for the count, which I don't know if you remember, but we had played the Rangers a, a bunch of times that year in the regular season. And Sam Dyson, the guy was nasty, right? Yes, but he only yeah. had one, one pitch, really. So it was just a matter of do or die with him. You knew he was going to throw you the sinker. He threw it like 97% of the time. It was a matter of location and just seeing him up. His ball ran a lot and he threw hard, so it was hard to get one of those ones that you can actually drive because they stayed up because he was really good at aiming down below the strike zone. And he threw two in the dirt. I was able to see those good out of the hand. Then he threw one a little higher. I hit it off my foot. Um, and then I was just like, you know, you don't have to swing as hard. He throws hard. As long as that ball starts a little higher, all you got to do is make contact. All, all I'm, I was trying to do was hit a fly ball to get the guy in from third. One thing I did not want to do was hit a ground ball for a double play. Um, and sure enough, he threw it a little higher. I just kind of was quick to get the, the bad head out. I, I know that it looks like maybe a big swing, but in my head, I took a super short swing just straight to the ball, and I just flushed it. You know when you flush a ball and you have a good finish? You know, you no, no, sorry, I don't. Go ahead. <laughs> you, we take 10 million swings in a year. So when you when you just feel have that feeling, it's like takes over. You just have that high finish and it just feels like you you swung through butter, right? You didn't you don't feel even the impact. Um I knew that I that I got it at that point. And you know, that that was a feeling that is hard to replicate and the stadium was going nuts. It felt like the earth was shaking. And I kind of blacked out there for a minute because I don't remember running the bases. The only thing that I remember is coming back and sitting in the dugout and somebody giving me a cup of water. Uh, and, and it was a crazy couple of minutes there for a second. You know, Hose, that, that's, that's gonna, that goes down in baseball history as one of the most dramatic home runs ever hit, right? You know, there's, there's, you got some Bobby Thompson. You got, you got Joe Carter's wa walking off the, the World Series, right? But there's just something different about this one. And you know what? I tell people this all the time. 
you could have you could have put had any anybody else hit that home run, right? Star player, average player, right? It would not have been the same. It just would not have been because you are the face of the franchise. You know, you, you've been there through the lean, the lean times, right? You know, you you were making your mark in the game, tremendous years, but you had no not, not enough supporting cast. And there's just there's something something you know in in you had that personality in the game. This was your team. You were an emotional player. It would not have been the it would not have been the same if anybody else ever played the game. Hit that. I I, I, tr- I truly believe that. And and that's why you know, man, we're old oh, man. You're gonna have them grandkids sitting on your lap. You're gonna flip that on and go. It's there's gonna still play that forever. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, and it creates a memory, right? And that's the interaction between oh. the fan, the fans, and the sport. And that's that's ultimately why we do this. You know, if you think about it, really, why do people want to watch sports? It's to create moments and memories like that one. So for me to be even the guy, like you said, to be stepping up to the plate in that situation, I was lucky enough. And to make something like that happen is, is really rare. So I definitely understand the, the you know, the fortune that I, that I had of being that guy. Yeah, you, hey, you came through. Hey, okay, then we move on. Then we move on to we 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 close out the Rangers. We play the Kansas City Royals. You had a tremendous postseason. We we get down. To, you know we. Did, my only regret we didn't win it that year. I thought that was the team to do it right. But that's hey, that's baseball. They had a good, they had a good club, different type of club, but they were really good. But that game six, hey, you tried to single handedly win that sucker, hitting the two home runs. You hit the home run to tie. I mean, sometimes that you know when you hit that big home run against Texas, a lot of that stuff gets gets lost in the in the in, in memory. And you know, for a first time in the, I think that was your first playoffs, right? In that that year, in fifteen. Yeah, first first time ever. I mean, you you stepped to the plate. And that, a lot of guys, that's hard to do. A lot of guys have trouble with that in the postseason. Yeah, and I, I remember, you know, sometimes that's what that's what's good and cool, but also heartbreaking about baseball. Sometimes the breaks go your way, and it's pure bliss, right? But sometimes the breaks go against you, and and it kind of sucks. I remember somebody hitting a home run on their team and a fan leaning over, you know, in right center. And I thought for sure with the review that was going to get called back and it didn't. I remember, uh, you know, the miscommunication between uh, uh, Ryan Goins and myself on a pop-up that opened up a big inning for for the Royals. So it was bittersweet that postseason for sure. Uh, But, you know, I agree with you. I felt like that year we, we had a pretty good chance and, I was like the one that slipped away, you know. Yeah, but you know what? It, it, it's still uh, some kind of year, man. And you That's know, right. to be a part of that with you guys, and uh, it was a special group. Is there? Uh, we're we're going to let you go here. And if you look back on your career, you know, you you made your mark in in Toronto. You know, is is uh, anything you want to say to the fans up there? Is it? Uh, is go ahead. We're going to beat. The, we're going to beat the, your ceremony. To the punch today. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I, I'll save some of the some of the details and some of the little uh, surprises for that day. But listen, uh, I came to Toronto as a guy trying to find a spot, and not only the organization and the coaches and the players and the staff, but every single one of the fans just welcomed me from the first day, and it was a great um, kind of place for me to come uh, or to get to leave in Pittsburgh because you know. Like we talked about the transition between uh, front offices and organization. Sometimes when you're in an organization and you're part of the guy, the group that's leaving, you know, they certainly, it doesn't feel good, right? You know that they're cleaning house and you're going to be part of that exit. Uh, so I left Pittsburgh going through a similar transition, coming into a new place in Toronto that was seeing something in me and wanted me to be a part of what was happening next. Uh, it was a great feeling to be somewhere where I was welcome and, and looked as an asset and somebody that could contribute and be a part of it. And I'll never forget that. And then the fans is just the love for the team nationwide and how they embrace all the players. It was different. You know, a lot of teams in the U.S., they they have historical teams like the Pirates, the Cardinals, the Yankees, and some of the old franchises like the Cubs. And that's also different. But for some reason, it had gotten diluted in Pittsburgh a little bit. And I don't mean to talk bad about them, but the situation had changed there. So going to a place where the Blue Jays were like the crown jewel of a whole country, not just a town, it was palpable. You could feel it. 
and the fans make sure that they um, they let you know. So it was uh, uh, really exciting and, and good for me to get to Toronto when I did and uh, and just make the rest of my career at home uh, there. So and that's truly what has, has become for me. Toronto is, is my second home or my home away from home. And uh, I'm forever thankful. Well, listen, Ken, yay. Tremendous career, and I'm honored to have been a part of it and, and to watch it, you know, day in, day out. Uh, you know, nobody deserves it more to go on the level of excellence. As I hope you enjoy it, and I know you and your family's awful proud of you. So, listen, I'll see you this weekend. All right, great job. Thanks again for coming on our show. Thank you, Gibby. Great as always. Right. Appreciate it. All right, man. What a great honor this weekend for Jose Batista and uh, what a great uh, gabbing with Gibby John. That was really awesome to listen to you guys. You know, Johnny, he's a, he's a special guy. He was a, one heck of a ball player, you know, and uh, you look at the names that are on that level of excellence, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, but he's, he's one of the all time blue Jay greats, you know, and uh, you know, it wasn't easy for him. You know, he was, he was kind of a journeyman early on until he found a home there. Um, but then he came on strong and he was one of the best in the league, you know, in the, in the, but I, you know, I get, I don't think he gets enough credit either with, you know, with, uh, how good a defender he was in the outfield and, and base runner. He really had the whole game because, you know, when you, when you become the home run King, that's all they, they'd like to talk about. Yeah. Well, he had a lot of other, uh, skills and just a wonderful ball player. And what a great, what a great guy. Wow. Very, very cool. John. Well, uh, now. Inspired by our friends at Miller Lite, it's time for this week's Roast and Toast. So, John, I'm going to ask you, uh, I think you got a roast this week, and it happens to be with an infielder for the White Sox that got into a little brouhaha, Tim Anderson. So while you're roasting Tim Anderson. <laughs> hey, hey, no, you know, hey, I got accused along the way as being a, a, an angry dude, you know, when I when I had – a couple of dust ups with like Hill and Brand and Lily and all that. And I'm really not. So, but to be fair to Tim, but a yeah, lot's been going on with him. You know, uh, we, we had an issue with him when Stroma was pitching one time and he was, uh, I don't remember what year it was. And they were jawing back and forth at each other. And then, and of course you had the, uh, he, I think he bumped an umpire that was maybe earlier this year or was it last year, got suspended. And then he had the Donaldson deal. Yeah. And now he's got this, you know, with Ramirez for the, the uh, Indians known as one of the nicest guys in the game is like right. the common denominator, <laughs> denominator, man. Uh, he's had some, he's, he's had some uh, battles. So maybe he needs to tone it down a little bit. And, and uh, but you know, Hey, you know, bro, they skirmishes like that happen. That's, that's, that's part of the game. Um, uh, but not but, you know, very the often we actually see guys drop their gloves and, and start, you know, boxing with each other. But I got to say one thing, you know, roasting the guy, he took a shot that looked like it just grazed. The it looked like a pro wrestling hit, and he went and he went down. <laughs> Glass jaw, man. See, that's the thing. That's the thing, man. When you square up, and you put them knuckles up. You know what? <laughs> Next thing you know, you're going dunk. I, I guess that's just, that's the it, roast. It was like take some box. It was a great box wrestling bump. It really was. It should have been on <laughs> AEW or WWE for sure. But now the worst yeah. part, you know, the, the tough part is, you know that. the, now the commissioner, when the commissioner gets involved with brawls and things like that, he he usually pretty stiff penalty. But I guess you know uh, the Blue Jays are going to Cleveland, so Ramirez may be out a few games. Yeah, you, you know I hate to look at it that way, but <laughs> he's, he's one of the the premier hitters in the game. That, that, yeah. That's for sure. You got to take advantage of what you can, right? <laughs> so that's right, exactly, exactly right. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, we have to toast somebody uh, uh, also this week, as we do each and every week. But this year is a special one for you. Uh, this week, this week is a special one for you, John. The Jays lost their longtime photographer, Chuck Kochman, from cancer last week. Uh, they held a moment of silence on the field last Thursday. Uh, today, the Gibby Show toast Chuck. Uh, Gibby, can you share any memories of somebody you knew really well? Yeah, you know, Johnny, he was just one of the good guys, you know. And oh, oh Chuck, he's around, he's around every day. Tremendous photographer, but just a good guy, you know. He cared about, you know, always, he'd come around, he'd ask how your family's doing. I used to go out to the field a lot of times early 
you know, before we'd start batting practice or stretch and things like that, I'd sit in the dugout if we had some early work. And Chuck would always be there early. He'd come over, sit on the bench, and we'd just sit there and talk, you know. And, and uh, uh, last time I saw him, I knew I knew he was, uh, he wasn't ill with the, ill at the time. You know, his body he said it was beat up from carrying all that camera equi- equipment around, but. You know, he became friends with everybody, you know, and uh, there's so many good people up there, that, especially that, that work the stadium and, and they're there every day, just like the players are, right? And and, the, and they touch your life because they're, they're good people, man. They care about you. They care about more than just the game of baseball, right? And uh, that, that was Chuck uh, all the way. So, yeah, big loss for up, up there, you know, but a, a big gain up there in heaven, that's for sure. Yeah, John, it just sounds like he was a special guy. And uh, we'll be back with another uh, Roast and Toast uh, next week. And, of course, we'll be back again next week. Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite, great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Yeah, so this will wrap up this edition of the Gibby Show. For John Gibbons, this is John Arezzi. We'll talk more baseball with you next week right here. And, John, have a great trip up to Canada, not once but twice. Enjoy yourself, and we'll get all the deets on the next episode. So uh, have hey, a you great know what? Hey, hey, it's only like 105 here today. My wife was asking me, go, what's, what's the weather going to be like up in Canada? I looked at Vancouver. It's like low 70s, and then Toronto's like high 70s, low 80s. I go, now that's paradise, man. South Texas, I don't know, man. Well, I don't enjoy know yourself anymore. up there in the Great White North. Uh, it's going to be a great weekend for you, John. We'll talk to everybody next week right here on the Gibby Show. Go Blue Jays. <laughs> <laughs>